Hello and welcome to our third Lily Park Photography Workshop. My name is Anne Wang and I'm a teaching artist with the Houston Center for Photography. As most of you know, usually we meet at Lily Park every first and third Saturday of the month from 9 to 11 a.m. But for this month of June, our workshops will remain online. Two weeks ago, I covered composition and focusing basics and today I will cover some more advanced features of composition. I hope you will join me on Saturday morning for our live Q&A on Zoom and also uh, you can bring some of your images to be reviewed. Thank you very much. Let's get started. Last week we covered the basics of composition. I talked about the rule of third, leading lines, symmetry, framing, as well as pattern and texture. I also talked about the importance of shooting both landscape and portrait, filling the frame and trying different viewpoints. Today we are going to look at uh, more advanced aspects of uh, composition. And Saladam said, you don't take a photograph, you make it. For this reason, it is essential to develop full awareness of what makes a good photograph in order to take great photographs. Always ask yourself, why would anyone be interested in this image I am about to make and what elements can be included or excluded to make it truly a good photograph? We can have balanced or unbalanced compositions. Balancing a composition involves arranging both positive elements and negative space in such a way that no one area of the design overpowers other areas. Everything works together and fits together in a seamless whole. An unbalanced composition can lead to tension. When a design is unbalanced, the individual elements dominate the whole, the whole of the image. In some projects, unbalanced might be right for the message you are trying to communicate, but generally you want balanced compositions. We are going to talk uh, today in this presentation about creating tension in your images. But first, let's review the rule of thirds. For the rule of thirds, you simply, div you simply divide the frames into nine parts and align the key elements with the horizontal of, or vertical lines. So here we align the lighthouse with one of our vertical third. The lighthouse is the main subject and we align the horizon with the bottom third because our sky is interesting in the above two third. And using the rule of third really creates harmony and balance. It adds more complexity to an image than just placing your subject in the center. It creates energy and it gives your photo a sense of depth rather than just being a flat image. But if you look here on the left of our image, we have an interesting sky. What about if we didn't have any clouds in this sky? We would have an empty space, what we call a negative space. That takes us to balancing elements, which complement the rule of thirds. When you place your main subject of center, as will the rule of thirds, it creates a more interesting photo, but it can also leave a void in the scene, like a negative space, which can make it feel empty. So you should balance the weight of your subject, here the out sign, by including another object of lesser importance to fill the space. And here our space is filled with the building in the background. The visual weight is balanced, therefore allowing the eye to bounce back and forth between the elements creating a dynamic picture. So here, the visual weight of the road sign out is balanced by the building on the other side of the shot. And also, it creates a narrative around the subject relationship, which takes me to my next slide about subject relationship. I've talked about storytelling and building relationships between elements a few times already. Relationship between elements is so important in creating a narrative when subjects cannot speak for themselves. 
so that you can tell they can tell what and where they are and really that's what subject relationship is all about when thinking of subject relationship in your photography, you will find yourself using other techniques to make it work, like the rule of thirds, leading lines, negative space. All these are key. So, for example, in the image that we are seeing in front of us, it's about a place, London. And there are just two key elements that are giving you the information you need to know where the image was taken. There is nothing else. It's really simplicity. So we have our main element on one third and then we have the wheel on the background and that creates tension between the primary and the secondary element. We have subject relationship, we know where we are, we've created a bit of storytelling here. So really rule of thirds, balancing elements and subject relationship are three rules of composition that really work well together. The power of negative space. I really like this technique. The aim is to place your subject on an unobtrusive background of space or color. This negative space will help define the shape of your main subject and it makes your main subject stand out or pop out of the image. And here the plain background and the colors are very powerful and they really help to define the shape of this person walking in front of this colorful wall. Um, when photographing people, negative space is actually a very good alternative to a busy background and it gives a, an easy solution. And uh, it's a great way also to um, create depth in a photograph. In this image, uh, we have trees that are emerging from the, from the fog in the background. However, the effect of negative space is still there and is really defining the shape of the bare tree, as we can see it here. Let's now talk about dynamic triangles. Dynamic triangles are really keen to leading lines and they share a vanishing point, like in the image that we have in front of us. So for high energy and perspective control, they are a great technique to use for just about any genre of photography. I've mentioned this a few times, but look, really look in the four corners of your image. Where are your leading lines coming from? Are they placed in a way that creates the highest energy and the best perspective? I always tell this, start from the four corners and work your way in. So this picture is of the Samuel Beckett, uh, Beckett Bridge in Dublin, and it has plenty of triangles and diagonals in, 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 in the scene. So the bridge in itself is a triangle. Then there is the sidewalk leading to the bridge. There are also several implied triangles in the scene. If you notice how the leading lines here in the green on the right of the frame are all diagonal and from triangles that all meet at the same point, at the same vanishing point. So all this creates a lot of dynamic tension in the scene. So we have two combined techniques here to compose this image, which are leading lines and diagonals. And that's what creates a very powerful image. So here, the same thing, that's a very interesting um, image of uh, L'Hôtel de Ville in Paris. It's very different, it's skewed, you know. The implied um, triangles and diagonals create a sense of dynamic tension. And again, they all meet at the same vanishing point as in the previous image. We are really not used to seeing buildings leaning at such angles, you know, in our daily life. So it's challenging to our senses and this is what creates the visual tension and makes it interesting. Let's move on to something a little trickier than our dynamic triangles, which is the golden triangle. That's very much like the rule of third. But instead of a grid of rectangle, rectangles, we have 
triangles. So we, dif we divide the frame with a diagonal line coming from one corner to the other. And then we add two more lines from the other corners to the diagonal line. Okay, so that divides the frame into four triangles. This is what we call the golden triangle. And you can see this is a way of composing that helps us introduce an element of dynamic tension in the image. As with the rule of thirds, we use the lines, the triangles in this case, to help us position the various elements in the scene. However, instead of positioning the major elements on the lines of third, here it is a little more about creating zones of different visual interests. If you see in the above triangle, we have the sky, the below triangle, we have all the roads that cross. On the left triangle, we have the framing with that tall building. And on the right, we have these stripes of moving lights. So this is what creates this very dynamic image. And as in the rule of third, you can use the points of intersection to position important elements in your image. So this is really um, creates some direction in how the viewer is going to read the photograph. This image also uses the golden uh, triangle and it has a very uh, emotive feeling. And um, it's amazing how the triangles are working to help the narrative of the image. Uh, the left triangle is actually leading out of the image. The top one is leading into the right triangle, which is a negative space. And the bottom triangle is the bond holding it all together. There is a narrative that is displayed by section here. And I think um, it's quite amazing how this image is working. It's a beautiful image, full of emotion. Move to the trickiest of all, which is the golden ratio. The golden ratio is actually a mathematical ratio and the number 1.618 is called phi, which is the, the value of the ratio. It is also called uh, the, the Fibonacci sp spiral. So basically what you do is that you are going to um, organize your image in squares. And the squares, what they do, here we have the stairs in our blue square. They help position the elements in the scene. Here we have our windows. We have one of the women. So you keep going like this and organizing your scene into squares. And that's like having an invisible leading line that is like a spiral. So why is this image with a big set of stairs interesting? Because this, that, you know, all these squares that create this spiral really takes us to these two women having a conversation and our eyes are going to bounce back and forth between these two ladies. Okay? So this is a tricky one. And it's called the fig read or the Fibonacci spiral. We can see it again here. Again, all our elements are positioned and it drives our eye through the bridge and above and to the main church that is lit. A lot simpler, it's a juxtaposition. A juxtaposition is a very powerful compositional tool in photography. Um, it refers to the inclusion of two or more elements in a scene that can either contrast with each other or complement each other. Uh, both approaches can work really well. And um, it's really a nice uh, tool to use uh, in storytelling. Um, I personally like it, like using it with two elements as illustrated in the image in front of us. I really like the simplicity of the ocean, um, 
in contrast with the complexity of the urban area. So this image is a little busier and more complex. Uh, it was taken in Paris. Um, in the bottom half of the frame, we have the book stands full of clutter and posters hanging from the tops. And rising above all is this uh, magnificent um, structure that is uh, Notre Dame um, Cathedral. Uh, they seem to be in direct contrast with each other and yet they work very well to together. And both are very um, iconic places um, in Paris and um, I think it works very well and it tells a wonderful story about Paris. It's a very nice storytelling image. Then there is the rule of space and from left to right. This is a basic rule telling you that you have to leave space for your subject to walk in and away or a space to look away. And then something to remember that's something that was brought to my attention when I was um, living in the Middle East. In the Western culture, we read from left to right. So our eyes are more comfortable with our subject moving from the left to the right in our images. And I noticed that my photograph, the photographers I worked with in the Middle East, when we were working with models, they really preferred their models to enter from the right hand side of the frame and walk from right to left. So uh, different cultures might have different preferences sometimes when it comes to composition, so that's something to keep in mind. Spot color. Well, that's very easy. Uh, when you have a very broad scene, you can place a bright or contrasting element of color to make it more interesting and attract the viewer's attention uh, to that point in the photograph. And that's a very, uh, very uh, self-explanatory example here in this image. The rule of odds. Um, apparently our brain looks for evenness and symmetry. So this principle asserts that having an odd number of objects in an image will make it more interesting and therefore more pleasing. The theory proposes that an even number of elements in a scene is distracting as the viewer is not sure which one to focus his attention on. So an odd number of elements is seen as more natural and easier on the eye. So I, I, I've used that a lot, but um, there are some cases where two might work really well also, especially when you're going with simplicity in an image. So, um, you know, that's, that's up to the photographer to decide what's the message they want to give. I love this quote by Albert Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. Everything in your frame has to be there for a reason. I've been saying this numerous times, you know, everything has to have a purpose contributing to the overall image, to the story you are trying to tell. Simplicity is a great technique to think about for your images because it will help you create images with more impact. It will train you to remove things that you don't need and get you moving your feet and thinking if you have the correct lens or not for what you're trying to achieve, okay? So in the photo above, we have a total simplicity of color. The color is beautiful, but also what, what, does, you know, what brings it together? what creates an order to the simplicity. You know, it's the fact that the colors are in an aesthetically pleasing bands of colors and also the lines going across the photo of colors fit in a sort of rule of third, you know. So all this works together. So it's simplicity, but there is a lot going into this image to make it beautiful. And for me, simplicity, I think, has the effect of provoking ideas of purity, beauty, clarity, 
It's very pleasing to the eye. Simplicity is also creating order out of chaos, which is something we need a lot um, these days. So let's move on to color. We were just talking about color in the previous slides. So I've got a quote here from Paul Outerbridge, who was um, best known for his uh, pioneering work in color photography and his avant-garde use of compositional space. He says, because that was right at the start of color, and he says, one very important difference between color and monochromatic photography is this. In black and white, you suggest. In color, you state. Much can be implied by suggestion, but statement demands certainty, absolute certainty. So just think about that quote. Color. Color is one of the most prominent features in a photograph. It grabs the attention of the viewer and implies mood. Different colors have different mood. That's very important to understand. And having an understanding of color relationship can also help create a more dynamic and interesting pictures. And we'll be talking about that in the next slide. A strong color on your main subject can add extra emphasis, while a strong color in an insignificant element can ruin the balance of a photograph. So for example, here, red is a very strong color and our subject is wearing red sneakers, which is fine. But imagine that we have a huge trash can on the left-hand side that is red. Our eyes will automatically go there instead of our subject. So you have to be really, really careful. So strong colors do a better job at catching our attention at first, but muted colors can be just as interesting and create just as much of a mood as a strong color. You just have to know how to use your colors in your composition. So really be careful with red. It's a very strong color. So warm colors tend to look vivid and create an energy feeling while cool colors evoke calm, soothing and emotional tone. And when you're going to use colors, color harmony is essential if you want to create a feeling of peace, tranquility or joy. And it is often the best choice even for other emotional tones. When colors are not in harmony, images tend to be perceived as either boring or chaotic. So in both cases, the human brain naturally rejects the image, creating an unpleasant experience. So really, you know, um, this is just an introduction to color, but I recommend that you go online and read about warm colors, cool colors, you know, the, the theory of colors and what it means, uh, what people are attracted, attracted to. It, it's very interesting to read. So I'm going to go over some ways that colors can play off each other to add balance. So we first have complementary colors, colors that are on the opposite side of each other on the, cor on the color wheel, like the orange and the blue here. They create a crisper, sharper impression than analogous colors. Analogous colors are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. They create a crisper and sharper impression because they balance and emphasize each other rather than flowing together. So you see like this yellow boat on the blue ocean and sky, there is a high contrast. While in the example below here, analogous colors create a gentle and peaceful appearance. You know, the leaf, the yellow leaf on the yellowish greenish moss there it's nearly kind of a monochromatic feeling. This method often works best when one of the colors is allowed to dominate the image, while the others are just providing accents or backgrounds. So this is just a very high level introduction. 
And the thing to remember is that warm colors advance into the foreground and add more weight to the image than cool colors which recede in the background. Okay. And these are more um, examples of colors. A red tint can add a warm and energetic feeling to a photo, while a blue tint, like in the upper right, can make a scene seem either calm or cold or sterile. Green is iner inherently calming and inviting color because it's tied to our natural surroundings. We'll be talking a little more about colors in some other workshops. So this was the last slide for today. Let's move on to hands-on exercise. So our first exercise is um, taking images while exploring Levy Park. Remember to respect our COVID-19 safety guidelines, like wearing a mask and respecting uh, social distancing. So I'd like you to make images uh, that illustrate what we've covered today, like um, using balancing elements and subject relationship, negative space, dynamic triangles, rule of odds, and also take um, in these images, also think about color. Use an analogous color scheme or com complementary colors. Uh, you can go in the vegetable garden for this in Levy Park. That's a great way to experiment with the different colors. And um, as usual, please do not forget to shoot both landscape and portrait and see which one works better. Fill the frame with what is important, what is your subject and what, what is the story you are trying to tell and try different viewpoints. So I would like you to um, take a few images covering each compositional rule. Our second exercise is quite different. I would like you to review um, your archive, your image archive, the collection of images you've taken recently. I'd like you to review them and select the best ones. And in the ones you've selected, try to think why are they good? Why did you select them? Is it because you did something right? And try to list which composition rules they follow. And then you might realize that actually they might not be that good. Um, in the ones that you like, do you see an emerging style? Are you more attracted to lines or texture? Symmetry or asymmetry? What about colors? Which are the colors that you use most? And, um, you know, once you've asked yourself all these questions, I'd like you to again go through this selection and maybe narrow your selection. And this will help you work towards a very good portfolio of images that you can share and you can be able to show your work. And uh, there is, um, with golden ratio and golden triangle, this one is a bit trickier. At, at least I find it a bit trickier. So instead of uh, shooting, thinking about golden ratio and golden triangle, either look at your image archive or look for images online that have the golden ratio or the golden triangle and train your eye to see and use this rule because it really creates uh, interesting and harmonious images. So these are our two exercises for this week. So you can share your images by tagging them, tagging them at Levy Park or hashtag HCP online. If you hashtag them HCP online, um, someone at HCP will look at them. And don't forget to uh, follow us at Levy Park Houston as well as at HCP online. You can also follow me at Anne Wong. For the ones who've taken my previous workshops, you have the link to our Google folder where you can share the images you're going to take as part of this workshop. Thank you very much for uh, joining me today and I hope to see you on Saturday for our live Q&A on Zoom. Um, during that Q&A, we can also review some of your images 
And um, the information for the Zoom meeting is on the Houston Center for Photography website under Education Levy Park Workshop. Thank you very much. Goodbye.